So it's an honor to be here, and um, since we're a small group, but a great group, can I ask you all to stand to actually come a little bit closer so we can make this you know, more intimate? So bring your stuff with you. How about like maybe the second row? And that'd be kind of cool. As more people come, they can, you know, they can fill in. So obviously, I've hired a lot of professors over the years, um, and so I'll be sharing some of those things. But what I'm actually doing on this one on, Th on Thrive is um, I get the honor of teaching lawyers and CPAs around the country. So lawyers and CPAs, to keep their status, have to have what's called MCLE. They have to continue to take courses. So I get them for eight hours to teach them ethics and basically how to be happy with who they are. So I'm going to do that eight-hour session in 50 minutes. That's, that's the goal, sort of, but you know some variations. Um, now, I'm going to ask you not to use your computers, to put your computers away, your cell phones away. And I do this with my students because there's a lot of research, by the way, that when people have their cell phones on, either, even though they don't have, they're not talking, they know their cell phone is on, they'll take part of their attention. If they have their computer on and as teachers, you'll never know what they're really doing with their computers and what sites they're really looking at. So I want everyone to be really present. You all got your worksheets, the yellow ones? The bright yellow, okay, stay where you are. Oh, we're coming, okay. Can I ask you not to, can I use you, ask you not to do that? Because again, and again, I like, I try and get electronics away when I teach, if possible. And I look, I do this to lawyers. I have like 100 lawyers in the room. And tell everyone, put your cell phones away, put your computers away. And then when I do worse than that, I'm about to do to all of you. Okay, so I tell them, okay, uh, you know, no electronics and so forth, right? Okay, so I do that. And then I do this one. They tell like eight hours and so forth. And then I tell them they have to write what? Their eulogies. If I have 100 attorneys, I tell them to write their eulogies. And I, by the way, and they do it. It's weird. You guys have three minutes. So if you look on your sheet, did you get your, the orange sheet? Cool. OK. So if you look on your orange sheet, and you look on your slide number one on the very top, a page one, it'll say eulogy. And you'll have a choice, by the way. It's like when you go to the, to the DMV and they ask you for your weight, you have the choice to put in what you would like it to be or what it really is. So I'd like you to write down, God forbid, right? What you think is if something should happen, God forbid, what they would say about you. And you have three minutes just to start, so it's really quick. This is called a set induction, for those of you who know teaching theory, just to get your mind in the right place. OK, stop for a second. OK, so here is my definition of person who will thrive. OK, who thrives? One, that they're curious about who they are. Who said that you have to have an examined life? Very, I'm impressed. Are you, are you philosophy? <laughs> Aha! Uh -huh. I'm impressed. Okay, okay. So the first thing to be curious about is, why do you think I had you write your eulogies? Very briefly. I really don't care what you wrote. What I care about is when you started thinking about what it would, like, what it would sound like, what went through your mind? What went through your mind when you started to think about it? Right. And those values that you might hopefully, okay, and for you, Angelica? Right. No, Angelique. Okay. Um, just love the type of person I would want to be. And yes. Want to be remembered by a bunch of others. Okay. And Rachel, with, in between the bites? Okay. <laughs> you keep biting. No, you keep chewing. Go. Yeah? Uh, just overall what I want out of my life. Right. So here becomes part of the problem. A lot of you think of, okay, I have to get through my, my PhD wherever I am, and I have to survive that, whatever that is, and then I have to get a job, and then I can start maybe thinking about what my life's going to be. So you keep putting things off, right? And then you get stuck sometimes. My goal is right now you start thinking about who you want to be and how you try and keep that balance even now with everything that you're doing. So understand that's why I have that. And you have to really figure out who you want to be. So curious for me is, that's why I had you do that, Okay, you all know Kohlberg, I presume. You've all studied 
Kohlberg a little bit? Okay, six levels of motivation. Now, by the way, heavily criticized primarily by women because Kohlberg has a hierarchy, right? Okay, women go, wait, it's relationship-based, so I acknowledge their problems. But Kohlberg says that there are basically six levels, and he uses other words, but I think this is a bit easier to understand. The lowest level is to avoid punishment. Now, I teach at Loyola in LA, right by LAX, but I live here in Santa Barbara. I live here in Santa Barbara because my wife hates LA, and I love her. I live here in Santa Barbara. See, it's very simple. When I'm driving down there in the morning, do you think sometimes I may go a little bit faster than the speed limit? Yes. Right. So I'll look at my mirror, and if I see a car with Christmas tree lights not yet on, I will slow down. What's my goal? To avoid punishment. For Kohlberg, his lowest level, just so you know. Okay. Next one, quid, quid pro quo. I do things to get a benefit. So my kids, when, they want, when I want them to clean up their room when they were younger, I have to bribe them. Like after six months of a clean room, we go to Disneyland. Something that would make them do it. That's quid pro quo. But for some of you, giving papers, writing articles, whatever it is, the quid pro quo is, if I do this, I'll get published. That will be a better sign for me or whatever happens to be. As a student, I turn papers in. Good person, this one, Kohlberg says, the most powerful of all the levels is not about being good at all. It's about that someone who you want to like you will like you. So think of uh, Easter or Passover just happened, right? Did any of you go somewhere that you really did not want to go, maybe to a Passover Seder or over to an Easter party, whatever it was, you didn't want to go, but as a good son, as a good daughter, as a good boyfriend, as a good girlfriend, whatever it was, you went. So somebody, like maybe the parents, would think you're a good person. That's good person, not good per se, but someone you're trying to please, to impress. These are not great levels. Next one's follow the law. Okay, it's two o'clock in the morning and while you're up driving, I'm not sure why you're doing that, you come to a red light and there's no police officer for 10,000 miles. But you stop, you wait, you go back and forth on the pressure plate and then you make a right turn, a U-turn, then a right turn. Is that legal? Yes, but you didn't break the law. Social contract, lock and so forth, right? That is, I do things to the benefit of others. And finally, follow your core values. Now for Kohlberg, this is gonna be ah, Mother Teresa. This is gonna be Gandhi. So, I'm curious. Okay, who haven't I bothered yet? Okay, did, are you still chewing? <laughs> yes, you are. Okay, and your first name? Anthony. Anthony, Anthony I'd put you in spot here. Where would you put most American women? You gotta pick a spot. <laughs> and you're the only one here who can. I, I, I know some amazing women, so uh, I would put them in the core values. No, 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 that's Gandhi, that's Mother <laughs> Teresa. No, 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 let's, let's be honest. Within these, <laughs> these bottom four, and I'll tell you where Kohlberg puts them. Okay, where do, where do you put women? You can't go core values, mm. nor social contract. Mm. Most American that's women. Answer. What? That's my final answer. Ah. <laughs> what? So you think a lot of women will do things to make please, uh, to please other people. A lot of people put that. Colbert puts them actually between good person and follow the law. Okay, so we're still good. Okay, now I'm ready. Yeah. Most American men. Yeah, yeah I'm listening. <laughs> Probably a social Yeah, this is like okay. good. This is like okay. <laughs> quid pro quo. Yeah. They're only good because they get a benefit. I'm seeing a lot of nodding there. Kohlberg is not as ne negative as you guys are. Between <laughs> quid pro quo and good person. Okay? So you got a sense of what these things very quickly? Okay. Look on your sheet. You have the list, correct? Okay. Now mark where you are. And be honest. What motivates you? Are you a good person? That like you're trying to please other people all the time? Are you quid pro quo, you'll act ethically when you get something in reward for it? Like you'll give to charity because you get a tax deduction? Avoid punishment, you'll do stuff unless uh, there's a problem here. So mark where you are. Everyone has the, no, that, this one you're not gonna share. You gotta be honest. Just mark where you think you are. Did you all mark? Is it cheating to create a conflict dependent? What was that? Is it cheating to create a conflict dependent? 
Uh, right now, yes, it is cheating. <laughs> I want you, I want you to put, look at, well, hold on. We've done all these different places, right? right? The question is, where are you primarily? And that is not context dependent. Okay, it's okay, I'll help you if you want. <laughs> or put where most women are if you want to go there. But <laughs> everyone have their spot? So I want you to be aware of what motivates you. Now, by the way, the research about Kohlberg was critical on this listing. The research that was not critical about what he did and agreed with him, once you become aware of where your level is, what will you ideally do, by and large? Stay or move? What do you think? You all do research. What did his research find? Most people, when they're serious about knowing their level, will want to go better. So I want you to be curious, because I want you to move better to basically embrace who you really are. So far, so good? Which means you have to know your level of motivation. You all got that now. But also your biases. I want you to presume that you are on a really nice ship, first time out, really cool ship, Four smokestacks, really exciting ship. Anyone know what ship we're talking about? First time ever, four smokestacks on a ship. The Titanic. Unfortunately, whether the Titanic hit the iceberg or the iceberg hit the Titanic, it was not good for the Titanic. But you guys are lucky. You guys got into a lifeboat, and this is the lifeboat that you're on. Unlucky, the big gash in the side of the lifeboat. So who would you throw out first? And just so you know, the water is very cold. I want you to throw them out. Uh, to use the word from the famous movie, right, Godfather, number one, you will sleep with the fish. So, okay, who wants to go first? <laughs> who would you throw out first? Not you, of course, but who would you throw out to lighten the boat? Quickly, pick one. Be honest, who would you throw out? You hate opera? Are you kidding? <laughs> Whoa, okay, opera star. Un interesting, okay, opera star is gone, okay. Who would you throw out? CEO. What? CEO. Which one, I'm sorry? The CEO. The CEO, because you have no value for business people. Right. Because you're a philosopher. <laughs> I got it, okay. And you? Oh, I've got to say, I don't know why, but I'm right on team two. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the same order. Probably uh, the engineer, 30 year old engineer. Why? Oh, that's weird. Okay. You guys are really good, you're very smart, and you are really outside the norm. Let me tell you what normally happens, okay? And this I do with lawyers and CPAs around the country for many years. This is norm, what they would do. You guys aren't normal. Okay, hold on. First one they throw out, by and large, is the grandparent. Because they are what? They're old. Yeah, because you're ageist, right? So, and now, by the way, under federal law, when are you considered old, if you're curious, legally? You know, guys don't know? Age 40. After age 40, you get legal protection, just so you know that, ADEA. Okay, remember I teach law, I know these things. Okay, so. Okay, that's the first one they throw out. Second one they throw out, by and large, is the CEO, because they're both where? Older. Older, right? Third one, strangely, is a 25-year-old. Why? <laughs> yes, because under social status, you know. Now, could that person become redeemed by going to law school? Okay, that would not redeem him or her. But could that person be redeemed by maybe going for a PhD somewhere, but that's not what they look at, look at currently where they are. If you ever go to a party, first question right now is what, what school are you going to, right? Second question is, you know, other things, right? When you go to a party, let's say outside, it's gonna be your name and then what do you do? And if someone says they're unemployed, if you look very carefully, most people kind of take a step back, either physically, you can really watch that, or just to kind of turn off because that person is no longer exciting to them. You can really, and those people, if you've been unemployed, and hopefully it won't happen, 
The first month it's kind of cool, you can sleep late, everything else. <laughs> Second month, third month, you feel isolated. Friends don't call as much, it's, it's a hard place to be. So a lot of it is social utility. Who do we value? And someone does not value opera stars. I can't believe it, okay, okay. But it's so, who we value, who we don't value. We all have biases, in other words. Each of us has a bias. So if I were to change this and put in genders, would that change things? Some are women's, yes. If I was to do the other things, so things may change, so we have our biases. So I'll make one very clear. You guys all like sports, I presume? You like sports? Okay. So, so UCSB has really good teams. Loyola, we keep trying. Now, I'll make this very simple. Um, I have not met you yet, and your name is? Crystal, you are the coach for the Loyola women's basketball team. And actually, our team's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's NC2A time. You have to tell what students you're bringing in to your team, right? And it's 10 minutes for your team to get certified, right? And you get a call from one of the people you were hoping to bring onto the team who decided to go to UCLA. So you have a problem. You have one spot. You've got five minutes to fill it. And you didn't think you'd have to fill it. You did not do your homework well and you only have two potential candidates. And all you know is one thing about each one. One person is black, the other one's Jewish. That's all you know. Who would you pick? And I'll tell you who I would pick immediately. Who would you pick? Football. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I got most improved trophy for basketball when I was in high school because I tried really hard but had no talent. <laughs> okay. So we have our biases. We all do. We have biases with hiring people. Most of us like who we are, and therefore we tend to want to hire people like us. We've had experience about certain people, especially because maybe because of race or even religion or ethnicity, what it happens to be, and we have those. If you're not aware of them, you act out on them. If you are open to at least be aware of it, you're much more careful. So I think, again, the person who thrives is aware of their motivation, Colbert, correct? But also aware of their biases and why they don't want to act out on them. As a chairman of a department hiring people all the time, we have to be very careful because initially when I first started, primarily we were white males. Now we're pretty much half women and all sorts of different national origins and different ethnic groups and so forth. But it took a while to do that and I had to call out people to make that, that type of change. Okay, so far so good about being curious, but now, what influences your life? Like, why do you want to be successful? Why do you want to be successful? Probably self and societal expectations. Which one? Probably, my, probably myself first, and then societal expectations. Oh, good, yeah. but that's unusual. You are unusual, and I like that. Mm -hmm. Most people, Parents, no matter whether the parents are alive or dead, you are still trying to make them happy with you, or you become so angry, you want to make them even more angry. But either way, like who here has done things to make their parents angry? Just curious. Yeah, I got that, yeah. Like for me, I was very successful as a lawyer, as a CPA. Yeah, cool. And then I wanted to become a rabbi, and they said, no, it's not successful. <laughs> and I go, yeah, that's who I need to be. So it was interesting about, the, and their, their, their pushback was not easy. They were, they were pretty hard on that. Or when I decided to get married, my last name is Gross Schaefer. So my wife's name, her maiden name was Gross. So I took her name as part of my last name, right? My father was furious. The role of a woman for him was to take care of the husband. I said, no, we're partners. And I'm going to support her and she's going to support me. And that was something that was outside of his mindset. And he even had to say to him, you have a choice. Either you accept this and are supportive, or I won't be seeing you for a long time. Take your pick. So sometimes it's hard for all those various reasons. So Sal told that. Now this one, most people don't, they know they're not, they, may, they may not be happy, but if they think society thinks they're really successful, they will stay there. I've helped many people in major law firms, big law firms, Loeb and Loeb and others, who are making a lot of money and they have status and they're miserable. 
and I have to give them permission <laughs> to leave and go to a smaller law firm, go to legal aid, something else that may not be successful by societal standards, but what they want. Where I'm gonna push you as well. When you start looking for where you want to go, you might be excited about what type of university you could get into. The status, whatever it is. And what I'm trying to get you to go to is the place that will make you thrive. And that might be very, very different. Uh, very honestly, my, one of my sons got into for a PhD program. He's unusual, he's weird. But he, so he got accepted to Harvard and to Princeton and NYU and Chicago, okay, amongst others. Where did everyone think he should go automatically? You got it. We started talking to PhD students there, and they all said, don't come here. <laughs> and what was the reason? Because Harvard, in effect, and we talked to a lot of them, you should be so happy you're coming to Harvard, we own you. So if we have a course to be taught, you'll teach it. If a professor needs help, you'll help. And if you have to give your research up a little bit, that's life. And he decided he was not going to go there because it was not where he was going to thrive, as an example. Just as an example, okay? And by the way, so I try and get people to look at all four of these. This one is, by his way, divine, spiritual. Notice I forgot to highlight this one. <laughs> okay. Um, but there I want people to say, if it's part of who you are, is God, whatever term you want to use, Allah or um, whatever, great spirit, is that person or that energy, that happy with how I'm using the gift of life. So it just, it's just to give you a larger picture of who you are. So this whole thing about being curious about getting you to have a sense of who you are, okay? So one is your motivation level, right? Okay, you all got those things? Okay, interesting so far? Cool, okay. Now, why does UCSB have a mission statement? I mean, why not, but why? And it's not just for donors. Well, maybe K. But why does it have a mission statement? I think when it comes to making tough decisions, you can come back to that. Know where you're going. Yeah. Yeah, got it. Okay. How many of you have personal mission statements about who you are? Okay, that's changing right now. Okay. Again, I'm doing this quickly. I apologize for this. I'm going to do it in a simple way. I'm going to tell you there are four steps to it. One, two, three, four. And it's up on slide. Hold on, you have the slide, you have the slide, you really do. Um, I want to say it should be slide number five. Okay? Okay. So, very quick, you're going to write this, and I apologize for time. I want to put down number one, one sentence heroic ambition. So, on the right side, it gives you room. What is your heroic ambition? And it can't be about being successful or being wealthy. We well, guys go into academia, forget the wealth. But, <laughs> but what's your heroic ambition? So for me, I want to make the world better for those who are less advantaged. That was a major part for what I'm doing. Okay, so that, that, that impacts and motivates me. Like with the archdiocese, I have a new brochure coming out for the undocumented community what their rights are on a tariff page, if they can stop by ISIS, what to say. So I like doing those types of things. So what's your heroic ambition? That's number one. One sentence. Yes? Did you all do that one? And again, sometimes it's good, like here in the old adage, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly just to get started. So don't be critical, just write that whatever comes to mind. Okay, so far so good? Okay, second thing, two challenges of why it's going to be hard to achieve your goal. Two challenges why it's hard to achieve your goal. For me, to do philosophy, a challenge for me would be learning German. It's a hard language. My son has to learn that for his PhD. He has to go to Germany this summer to learn German. Plus, it's those really long words. 
Okay, and they're hard to say. Okay. Plus, you have to be really smart. That was my second challenge. Okay. Three, how will you know if you're moving towards your heroic ambition? Scientos, how do I know I'm doing to it? Like for me, when I started really wanting to make the world, that I would do things like help uh, new immigrants. That's why I worked also for a, a legal aid attorney. Uh, help people who were poor. So I wanted to do things. So I would work. So my, my, my goals were I'd work as a lawyer for a while with people who had financial needs and then as a professor try and do things that would help those who have needs. So refugees right now. Okay? Whatever it is. So you can kind of judge, yeah, I'm moving that direction. And finally, step four, I want you to be balanced. What I mean by that is if you're like PhD students that I know, you're really busy doing your work and everything else. Why are you taking time for, give me the other groups you have to take time for, yourself physically, but also yourself spiritually, going for walks, doing things. If you have a relationship, for the relationship's needs, right? And a lot of people decide to give those up, at least for a while, but some of them never get it back. So if you go to work as a major law firm called Big Law, you heard that term, Big Law, or the major law firms? They basically tell you, for the first few years, it's not so bad, just 10 hours a day, seven days a week. But we'll give you, in some of them, a new shirt every day you do that. See, we give you a benefit. But what are they really telling you? You owe them your loyalty more than your family. As an example. And some, like, I want to see, I want to be, I want to know I could make it as a CPA, as an example. So I went to a major firm when I got out, and I worked those types of hours, but I knew I wanted to do it for two years. Most of you don't know why. Do you know why I wanted to work for two years, only two years? To be a CP, you have to pass this extremely boring but hard exam. Then you have to work as an indentured slave as CPA for two years to get your actual certificate. So I did that, and then I left. <laughs> I went to a small litigation firm, and it was fun, actually, for me. But those two years, I knew it was going to be terrible, but I knew what the limit was and why I was doing it. But for a lifestyle, it's not who I want it to be. Okay? So, you got your basic thing? Okay. Who, who can read loud? Who's a good reader? And you're a good reader? Go. So, this is someone's mission statement written a long time ago. Go. Before I begin the holy work of healing creations of your hands. Okay, what does this guy do? He's a doctor. Not just a doctor. At that time, he was the best doctor in the world. Alexandria, Egypt, he was a doctor to pharaohs and everybody else. He was considered the number one guy. Okay, go. I place my entreaty before the throne of your glory that you grant strength of spirit and fortitude to faithfully execute my work. Okay, stop. So that's his heroic ambition, right? Pretty cool. Is yours that good? Just, I was just asking. <laughs> just asking, okay. Okay, next one. Let not desire for wealth or benefit blind me from seeing truth. Deem me worthy of seeing in the sufferer who seeks my advice a person, neither rich nor poor, friend or foe, good man or bad. Of a man in distress, show me only that man. Okay, what is that? So think of my four, my four pieces. What is that? Of the four pieces, what is that? It's a challenge. He likes working with the wealthy, but he's trying to, he has to, he was trying to understand that. He actually created, this guy never slept, by the way. It was amazing. He actually created a, where he lived, a clinic for people who were poor to come in, generally from 2 a.m. to like 4 a.m. in the morning, whatever time they were using those days. Okay? But that was one of his concerns. Because he wanted to be a healer for everybody, but he loved working with the rich. We can understand that. Okay, continue. If doctors wiser than me seek to help me understand, grant me the desire to learn from them, for the knowledge of healing is boundless. Okay, stop. What's that one? Another what? Another challenge. Another challenge, because is this guy arrogant? Just so you know, 
arrogant. He wrote a book with no footnotes because it said, I'm the footnote. This guy, he knew he was the best and he loved it. Because listen to his next, his next line. What's his next line? But when fools deride <laughs> me, give me voice. <laughs> okay. Let my love for my profession strengthen my resolve to withstand the derision even of men of high station. So then he was made fun of because he, he knew he was smart and everything else. And they made fun, they liked, have you ever had that where someone thinks they're really smart and kind of make fun of them? Okay, you guys would never do that. Maybe not. Okay, go on. Illuminate the way for me, for any lapse in my knowledge can bring illness and death upon your creations. Okay. I beseech you, merciful and gracious God, strengthen me in body and soul, and instill within me a perfect spirit. Okay, so if you have my standards, what grade would you give this mission statement? Go. Yeah, give me A, B, C, D. A what? A B. A B? I give it a C. Though, by the way, it's used at many hospitals <laughs> around the country. They still use this as one of the times to teach doctors what they're, how they're supposed to feel. Because there's the heroic ambition, right? There are challenges, right? Where are his signposts? He didn't put in here, I'm going to create a small place where I can have people come in who are poor. I'm going to actually listen and take notes when I talk to other people and try to take them seriously, right? Okay. And he's married with kids. Is that there at all? There's no balance. That's why I give it a C. Now, there isn't time, but I have a whole page for you guys to write your own mission statement. So homework. So at the very top, go back to the very beginning of the thing. At the very top of your thing, put down homework is to write my own mission statement. No more than six sentences. This is too long, by the way. No more than six sentences. And I must show it to someone who will be honest enough to tell me, yeah, that's me, or give me a break. Rewrite it, okay? If you're in a relationship with someone, it's important to have both of you write it. Write their own. And then make sure you're together. What happens very often with very busy people, they start to live parallel lives. And you really don't want that to happen. You want to make sure there's intersection. Okay, so far so good? Okay, you like that one? Okay, now this one's a big one. Okay, what are your core values? And I have a technique I want you to really get. This is, for me, the most important thing, if I can, of all the slides I want you to really see. But first of all, here are some basic core values. These are the basic ones. Honesty, integrity, promise keeping, fidelity, fairness, kindness, drawing work, caring, respect, citizenship. This means, by the way, uh, what, I, what it means by here in theory is um, I presume I'll be a good citizen, which means I vote, which means people are innocent or proven guilty, means I believe in pluralism, whatever the core values are of America that you want to put in. Excellence, accountability, um, responsibility, being a positive role model. You guys as teachers will be amazingly important, whatever, you, whatever you're going to go into, role models. People remember you. You will touch their lives, a lot of lives, and you won't even know how you're doing it. But just know that people will be touched by who you are, by your energy, how you treat them, how they're treated, all these things. Okay? So, and here's a little bit larger one. <laughs> I often do this for organizations and individuals. So, I want you to very quickly, on slide for you guys, that is your handout, that is slide. Who can find it first? Number eight? Okay. I want you on the left-hand side and on the left-hand side, put down your six core values. It does not have to be in a hierarchy. What are your six core values? And I'll give you back this list, okay, just to help you out. But it can be all sorts of things. And if, let's say, you're really religious, you want to put down WWJD, which means? What would Jesus do? Right, okay, as an example. Whatever are your six core values, and it can change tomorrow. So again, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly, just to get started. So, please, really quickly. Put only on the left side. Don't worry about the other one. Okay, you got your six? Cool. You haven't got your six yet? I'm waiting, because I'm watching the clock. I have to stop here in 10 minutes.
Again, it can be off that sheet. It doesn't have to be just that sheet. Here's some other ones if you want. Now, why is this a very important slide? <clears throat> when you start to interview, whether it's with industry, other institutions down the road, you're going to have to make some decisions about where you can thrive, where it's a good place for you. One indicator is your core values, and then you put down the core values of the institution, not what they say they are. After you talk to other people there, what they really are. I did this with my son when he was applying to his PhD programs. We looked at the core values of, in this case, Harvard or Princeton, whatever. His core values and the core values as we determined them, and that helped to make his decision. I do this with lawyers going to law firms. They're very different. Now, it doesn't mean there'll be a direct connection. Sometimes there's a lot that are similar. Never, it will never be the same. Some may be very different, so different it makes you stop and go, is this a good place for me? And it still may be because one, maybe the best institution you can get into, maybe a good place to start with. There may be reasons for it, but at least you know what's going on. Because here is the problem. It's a very serious problem. When you go to, let's say, are you going to go to, into uh, academic or are you going to go into a corporate setting? Do you know? I don't know. Let's presume let's, academic. academic. Okay. Or anyone going, perhaps going to a corporate setting, business setting? Okay. So I'll make it be easier for me to work with you for just right now. When you go to your corporate setting, will you be spending more time asleep or at work? No, no not probably. Definitely. <laughs> will you be spending more time with friends from work or friends from outside of work? Oh, a friend from work. <laughs> so what happens is over time, the values of where you're working will become your values. And if you're not aware of them, they will really seep into who you are. And you'll do things that take you away from who you are. This is to make you aware of your values and where you may be going. And you may have no option, or maybe the best place for you for all sorts. Like again, I went to a major CPA firm for two years. I disliked it. But I knew I did for two years for the reasons I had, but then I left, because I knew I was changing. Or I'll give you another example. I wanted to be a district attorney. So I decided to have the experience of, I was a law student, and a judge came in and said, I need someone to help me with the case, you know, to be a clerk, no money. And I said, oh, well, that'd be fun for me. Well, it was the Manson case, Charles Manson case. And, and I, I determined that if I did that in criminal law, I would see some of the worst of people and I would change. And that told me not to do that. I went to tax law. Never mind. But anyways, <laughs> but, but it's about at least being aware of who you are. That's why I have a mission statement to who you want to be, to know your core values. So far, so good? Okay. Okay. Um, I won't do the decision model because that will take too much time. Um, but this is kind of hard. You're going to always have ethical decisions to make. One of them, by the way, and I want you to be very careful about this one. I think hopefully you've been talked about this so forth. Um, I give to lawyers this particular case, a real one, where someone is a um, successful divorce attorney, represents her client, and some divorces can take a long time and involve a lot, a lot of money. Um, the names have been changed, obviously. Nicole was a very famous actress, a very beautiful actress. This guy, the attorney, short, overweight, balding. But for her, he was the one who was keeping her afloat. So look what he, this he called me, by this guy called me. And he told me, <clears throat> she has expressed that she finds you attractive. And I go, this balding guy, overweight? No way, okay, never mind. And interest in exploring a personal relationship. I think that's in his mind. She has made it very clear to you that she would see such relationship as a positive contribution to her healing, and you also believe that such relationship would not impair your effective representation. Give me a break. Anyways, moreover, you believe that 
The complex case will take several years, and it would be hard and unnatural for him to put off the relationship. Now, the reason he was calling me, by the way, because I deal with ethics for both um, lawyers and CPAs and rabbis, and also as a rabbi, he wanted me to say it was okay for him to do this. And as opposed to my saying, what are you, crazy? <laughs> what I did is I had him, in effect, make this list of three things, and I said, who are the stakeholders? And he, from his, what he said, who was his high stakeholder when, when he called me, honestly? You got it, himself. And I said, state bar and everything else, your code of ethics, who's your highest stakeholder? The answer is your client. What are your different core values? And sexual need is not one of them. <laughs> it's what? Think of the values that you wrote. Integrity, professionalism, and so forth, right? So professionalism <laughs> towards your client. This he was not happy where we were going. And then I talked about his options. You can have the affair. And of course, affairs always work out perfectly. What happens if it goes sour? Now what happens? What happens if the other attorney finds out? What happens if she feels she was not fairly represented? Who will she sue besides you, your firm? So I started, so he saw those things. And then I, we basically, after all the options, he decided to refer her outside of the law firm because he was too engaged and he could not separate himself from, from, from that. And, okay? Okay. Now, very quickly, we have three minutes. Number one, um, why do I want you to have, I know you're all students and poor, by and large, why do I always want you to still have money out in the bank? Allows you to take risks and to say the magic word no. Okay? And do we sometimes have an academia where there are some problems? Professor says, like, I've had a few cases where sex, uh, sexual issues have been, have been involved with new professors or with PhD students, whatever. I've also had situations of publishing where, oh, you're doing an article. Can I put my name on your article? Understand what that's, what's happening there? And then I'll vote for you, otherwise I will never vote for you. There are games that can, may they never happen to you. Okay? Friends outside of work. Why do I want friends outside of where you're working, especially if you're going to the corporate sector? That's from a their perspective. Yes. Who can say, what are you, crazy? I won't go into a certain case, but I, that a friend of mine called me, was doing something that was, for, was actually fraud. Um, very quickly, a psychiatrist. Uh, they were upset that Medi-Cal did not pay enough for the coming to see a psychiatrist, so they doubled the hours to get what they thought was fair. That's called fraud. And his whole firm was doing it. And I said, the way I said to him, I said, hey, I'm your friend. I'll visit you at least once a month. He said, what do you mean? In jail, because and you'll lose your license. Okay. Why do I want activities outside of work? What things excite you? What things animate you? You've got to do that stuff. And this about develop the sense of the values where you're working and so forth, right? And then have some tools to work with difficult people. There are people out there you don't really want to work with, and not that anything should happen to them, but if they disappeared, you'd be happy. And so I have a sheet where I discuss some of those things. Um, but I guess the biggest thing I want to say is, when I became a new professor at Loyola a long time ago, I had a department chair who we did not do well. It was not nice. And so I went to a place and I said, okay, why is he here? Why is he in my life? What am I to learn from him? So I went from a place of antagonism to a place of curiosity. What happened is when I had meetings with him, I wasn't so anxious. I was curious. I wonder what I'm going to learn today. It could be bad or good. But I was able to change, and so I wasn't so uptight and so forth. What I didn't expect, and you have no control over this, he became less antagonistic. It's not that we became friends, but he's the one that recommended me to take his place when he left his chair. So we built a place of respect. It doesn't always work, but it can work. And you may have some really hard things. I'll leave you with one last thing. 
I was teaching uh, two years ago, a new professor came in, that door is an example, and he said, excuse me, your class is over right now, and I said, I have 10 more minutes, he goes, no, and now you're supposed to be out of here. And it was weird, and the students were, you know, I said, I will leave in 10 minutes and then we'll talk, but I have my class right now, and he walked out in a huff. And so then, he, apparently he talked to other people and said, oh, big political mistake. He came to my office and said, I'm really sorry. And I go, what happened? What's going on? And as we talked, found he was at another university where the senior faculty took advantage of the younger faculty. And he was not gonna let that happen to him again. But he was stupid politically. And I said, you embarrassed me and my, and my, in front of my students. That was not nice. But also, it wasn't a good thing for you. Because I'm afraid this will get around the university, which it did. So I did a deal with him where I said, I want you to come in and apologize to my students and to me in front of the class. And I want you to explain what's going on. And then I will explain how sometimes senior faculty can be abusive. And we're going to do it in your class, in my class first, and then we'll do it in your class as well. He was going to be fired by the dean when the dean found out what happened. When he agreed to this, he was retained. He, he, he didn't really learn that much. He, a year later, he was, he was asked to leave. But it's a technique which I've, I've done very seriously. So because of time, I always stop on time. Any, last, any questions? I haven't asked it for really quickly. Any questions? Any comments? Really? You're in charge of this. OK. OK, so look over for that, because I look over the worksheets. So I've covered a lot of things. Let me go back to, to this whole thing. I want you to be curious about who you are. I think life's about growth and curiosity. I want you to have a mission statement. I'm very serious about that. What I, I, I teach uh, rabbinic students, and I have them write the mission statement, and then three years later, I send it to them. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> have you remembered? <laughs> what? Ah. And then core values and so forth. Okay, questions. I'm sorry, you had a question, I thought? I was, I was just wondering, uh, this, is, this is pretty macro, but I was wondering how it works on a micro level, like day to day. Is there something that you do specifically? Do you like, have a mission statement somewhere that you see every day? What I actually do uh, for my students, they have to make a, what's called a wellness kit. It's five pages in length. First page is a title page. And then they have to have their mission statement, their core values, and I have them make their own decision model. This is mine. I give them like four or five and they create what they want. But I suppose I have a list of quotes. I'm not sure about you, but I love quotes. I'm a good quote person. Like, what, what's one of your favorite quotes? Maybe you have a favorite quote? That's not bad. And that's a good one. One of mine is, because the work I do, I do other work with Israelis and Palestinians on a good day. Um, an enemy is someone whose story you've not yet heard by listening to other people. And um, with the work with, uh, with, the, with the refugees, uh, if we have no peace, it's because we've forgotten we belong to each other, Mother Teresa. So, so I have quote. So I have a, so I have all my students create that, and they and they've taken it with them. I have students who have called me back after 20 years. I had to use the, uh, the kit. So something. So it's so it's there. That that's what I do. That's what my students do. Otherwise, you'll just be forgotten. I don't want to be forgotten. You could frame it, but then people will see it, and you may not be comfortable with that. Because you have to be honest. Yeah? Yeah, so your professional career is incredibly diverse. You've gotten to experience so many different work environments. I was wondering if um, there are some characteristics of your most fulfilling positions that were consistent across many of these positions when you think yeah. back. One was a place where they allowed me, where they didn't have such a straight jacket of who I had to be. The CPA firm, very much of a straight jacket. Uh, the law firm I worked at, or legal aid or whatever, it was, it was like, yeah, you gotta do some of this junk, if you're stuck. But what do you really wanna do? Can you really ex explore? So at Loyola, the reason I picked an R2, not an R1, was for exactly for that reason. And I know I'm not a good researcher. I'm very honest. I'm not a great researcher. That's not my strength. I care about making a difference. I'll write articles, but make a difference. But 
if I have a choice, let's say, for a philosophy to read Kant in German or to read a summary in English, I want that summary in English, right? So, so I know who I am, and I want a place which will allow me to be there. So Loyola, I teach was the most important thing. Research was nice. It's become a little bit higher as we become an R2, but we're certainly not an R1. And I don't think I would thrive here as much as I can thrive there. So I made those types of decisions where I could do creative things. So when I told, um, like right now, uh, to do this brochure for the endocrine took a lot of time, a lot of energy. And my dean's excited I'm doing that. Will that count as a publication? Well, when I write an article about making it, it will. But <laughs> the brochure itself, no. And I'm okay with that. So that's what they'll get. And people who I like being with overall. It's never going to be 100%. Okay? Last question because I know we really have to break now. Okay. It's been an honor. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you guys later. Thank you.